Good morning, my name is Mary Yost. I'm president of the Sage Group LLC. This morning I'd like to talk to you about the prevalence of PAD and specifically why the 8 to 12 million number looks to be understating the prevalence estimates of PAD. Before we get into the presentation, I do have some disclosures. The Sage Group is a for-profit research and consulting company. We sell our products and services to industry, a list of the current clients, and we do own stocks. This is a list of the current stock holdings that might be relevant to this discussion. So to start with, why even discuss prevalence? Well, look at these two estimates of the economic burden of PAD. One is 74 billion and the other is 164 billion. So what is the difference between these two estimates other than the obvious that one is over two times greater than the other? Well, the difference is Prevalence. How many people have PAD? In the one case, 8 million, and in the other case, 17.6 million. Now, prevalence determines economics. Prevalence is the key factor in determining the economic cost of a disease, and prevalence is also a very important variable in looking at the market opportunity or the investment opportunity that a particular disease, in this case, PAD, represents. Prevalence depends on the population studied as well as the definition of PAD. In terms of the characteristics of the population studied, the type of population is important, whether it's a general or a clinical population, the sample size, of course, the age of that population, and the prevalence of risk factors in that population. In this case, the risk factors for PAD being diabetes, smoking, hypertension, kidney disease, etc. Now the definition of PAD over the years, there have been a number of different definitions that have been used to uh, define PAD. Uh, in older studies, you will find quite frequently intermittent claudication was used to define PAD. However, that's going to significantly understate the prevalence of the disease because only 7 to 15 percent of people with PAD actually have the classic symptoms of intermittent claudication. ABI, less than 0.90, that's a very common definition. The history of the disease as, as, def, as represented by history of claudication, history of revascularization, and history of re amputation. Absent pulses have been used. Um, invasive, there's a variety of invasive studies that can be used, angiography, MRI, CAT scans, and then combinations of the above. ABI less than 0.9 has been the most commonly used definition. This is quite sensitive and quite specific. However, it's important to keep in mind that other cut points have been employed such as 0 0.7, 0 0.8, and 1, so it's not always 0 0.9. In addition, this can be dependent on the method, and by that I mean it depends on whether the pulses are taken in one leg, in both legs, in one arm, or both arms resting or post-exercise ABIs, you can get different, different uh, results depending on how that's done. Now, ABI less than 0.9 will understate the prevalence of the disease unless you add in the history of PAD. In addition, in diabetics, those with chronic di kidney disease or other people with uh, calcified arteries you will get falsely elevated ABIs, so those, in those populations, ABI does not, does not give you an accurate reading of the prevalence of PAD. Finally, in patients that have subclavian artery stenosis, if the ABI is measured in one arm only, it will understate. And it's important to note here that in patients with subclavian artery stenosis, there's a five times higher prevalence of PAD. Eight to 12 million, that's the most commonly quoted estimate for the number of people with PAD. Although published in the partner study, this number was not calculated based on any results from that study. Rather, the 12% prevalence in those 40 and over was based on the Crickey San Diego study that was published in 1985. This study was done in a little over 600 white upper middle class individuals who lived in Orange County, California. Importantly, ABI less than 0.8 was the definition, and they also included a set of four non-invasive tests. The key thing to remember, though, is that 
The calculation of 8 to 12 million was based on the population circa 1995. Now that's almost 20 years ago. In the meantime, the U.S. population has become older and significantly more diabetic, particularly in those 65 and older. If you look at U.S. diabetes prevalence just in those 45 and older, you will see that there has been a significant increase in diabetes in the U.S. population. If you look at this slide, if you focus on the, the yellow bars of those 45 to 64, but focus just on the, red, the rest colored bars, that's the 65 and older group. That's a key group for PAD. If you look at, if you look at the results, in 1995, about 18% of those 65 and older had diabetes. By 2006, 31% had diabetes. Now another way to calculate PAD or to estimate PAD, PAD numbers is the diabetes method. That's something that we developed. According to this method, there's about 17.6 million people in the U.S. today with PAD. Now this method is a real-time population-based method which estimates PAD for two age groups, 45 to 64 and 65 and older, and estimates it by, by sex and glucose status. The studies that are used to look, to look at the prevalence of PAD by glucose status defined PAD as ABI less than 0.9 in addition to a history of PAD. Now the prevalence by the diabetes method, calculating backwards, is about 13% in the population 40 and over, and that compares with the 12% prevalence in the Cricky Partners method. The rationale for the diabetes method, well, diabetes is a significant risk factor for PAD, and if you look at the population 50 and older, in those who do not have diabetes, 10 to 20% have PAD, however, those who have diabetes, 30 to 40 percent have PAD. In addition, there are numerous large-scale population-based studies that have been published in peer-reviewed journals that have looked at PAD by glucose status and age and sex in the U.S., in populations in Europe, the Near East, Far East, in many different types of populations. So there's a tremendous amount of data here. Going back, if we look at the prevalence of PAD in the U.S. in 1995, note that the Cricky Partners method is 8 to 12 million. If you calculate the prevalence based on the diabetes method, it's 11.3 million, which is right in the middle of that range. Fast forward to the prevalence of PAD in, in the U.S. in 2010, the diabetes method, as we've said, 17.6 million. If you recalculate Cricky Partners method, you get a range of between 10 and 17 million, and that 17 million is, of course, right in line with the 17.6 million. Over time, if you look at the PAD prevalence in the U.S., uh, beginning in 1995, 11.3 million, 2010, 17.6 million. By the time you get to 2020, close to 21 million, and by 2030, close to 24 million with PAD. Now, PAD is not just a U.S. disease. It's a worldwide disease. Basically, it follows diabetes. In Western Europe, we have estimated that approximately 23 million people have PAD. The three top countries there are Germany, Italy, and Spain. We've also estimated in, in India that there are 16 to 24 million people with PAD. Comparing the prevalence of PAD in the U.S. with other major diseases, as you can see on this slide, uh, PAD is only exceeded by diabetes, with 26 million people with diabetes in the U.S. in 2010. PAD actually exceeds coronary disease slightly, coronary disease at 16.3 million. PAD even exceeds all cancers, about 12 million, and significantly exceeds both Alzheimer's and stroke. So this is a very prevalent disease. So our conclusions on prevalence, that PAD prevalence is underestimated. The PAD is highly prevalent at 17.6 million. The PAD numbers are projected to increase to 21 million in 2020 and about close to 24 million in 2030. The diabetes estimate is 
the diabetes epidemic, sorry, is driving PAD growth, not just in the US, but in Europe, India, China, and the rest of the world. That concludes my talk. The exhausted staff, we thank you.